Welcome to the Six Five Summit, AI Unleashed. I'm Dave Nicholson, and for this Enterprise AI Spotlight, I'm joined by Rory Richardson, Director of Next Generation Developer Experience and Gen AI at Amazon Web Services, which we all know by the power acronym AWS. We'll be covering AWS's customer-centric approach to agentic AI. Welcome, Rory. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's good. It's good to meet you. Thanks for being here. Um, let's dive right into this. AWS has been involved with AI for quite a while. Can you kind of walk us through uh, the history of how AWS got to where AWS is now in AI? You know, we started this journey well before the rise of generative AI. We started incorporating AI into the fabric of our services um, several years ago. So that uh, things like optimizations or um, performance analysis, uh, we've been using AI tools in the fabric of AWS for quite a few years now. The generative AI journey, though, is fairly new to just about everybody, which was um, uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, we went GA with Code Whisper, which I, I think was our first service that natively integrated generative AI into the fabric of the service uh, back in April of 23. Would you agree that we're sort of at the dawn of the age of agentic AI? And if so, how about if you give us your definition of agentic AI? Oh, I'm glad you said it was my definition, not AWS definition. This is a definition that keeps evolving, you know, as uh, the characteristics of agents continue to take on more properties or different properties. Personally, I like to land on the definition of agent with the three A's, but last week I added a fourth A. So I'd like to think of agents that uh, it is different than an application because it can form tasks autonomously. It can do things asynchronously and it can do so with agency, like in a pride and prejudice sense, being able to make some decisions on its own and have agency. But then I started to think about the, the rise of the super agents, which is what I see is coming next. And so I added a fourth word, atomic because now we're thinking about agents being more modular because we're starting to see the agent to agent communication protocols standardizing. Once that happens, we're gonna be able to build more and more complex things, just like with Legos, by combining different agents to work together. So when I'm thinking about like, what is the, the scale or the scope of any given agent I'm biased in that I try to, I tend to think of it in terms of like a microservice architecture and create an atomic uh, mindset or framework for the agents so that we can combine them in a gazillion different ways to form super agents, which it, it, the term super agents, it, it think of it like a, almost like a persona based way to get something done. Um, for instance, think about, um, an SRE, a site resiliency engineer. A site resiliency engineer has, as a human, a lot of different things that they can do. And these would each be separate agents sort of underneath the covers. You know, one thing that we learned uh, recently is maybe we shouldn't, you know, spend a lot of time trying to teach people different agents to go to. You know, like uh, if I teach you, if you wanna do a unit test review, that slash test, wouldn't it be cooler if you could just ask, hey, can you form the unit test on this corpus of code? And so it doesn't, it, we don't have to adopt an artificial language or another abstraction layer, but we can really get to natural communication just like you were talking to a human. So when you use the term super agent, you're talking about an aggregation of agents as opposed to implying that there's an agent that's, that is orchestrating the other agents? Oh, actually the latter. I think about okay. it in terms of uh, being a concierge. So okay. like when you go to a concierge at a really nice hotel, they handle everything for you. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've stayed at a really nice hotel in China and this this concierge was amazing. You would just say, hey, I'd like to have dinner at this at a nice restaurant. They would pick out the restaurant. They would order the driver. They would give you a translated menu. Like everything would automatically be handled based on the intent that they understood of the experience that you wanted to have. 
So being having an abstraction to handle the orchestration, picking what agents are best for whatever task, and then aggregating that result, well, it's more human. It's more natural in going from intent to the thing that you want to get done. So Rory, as we move forward with generative AI and other AI tools, what does the world of work look like for knowledge workers and, and for developers in particular? So I think we saw two things that were really positive. Uh, one, we were able to see that people were able to get up to speed faster. So for example, when we rolled this out internally, what we, we were able to see that our most junior developers, the noobs, were able to uh, learn our inferences and libraries faster. They were able to perform unit tests faster, get their documentation in, and even detect security vulnerabilities and remediation. So effectively what happened was that people were able to be more productive faster. Now, if you've been doing something, you know, a certain way all of your life, you're probably pretty fast at it. But getting, you know, those, those new folks on board, it can be tough. The other thing that we learned was to not necessarily focus on the hardest, most humanistic aspects of our work, but to think about all the stuff that we don't want to do anyway. Like documentation is a great example. No developer ever wants to write documentation. So if you concentrate your application of generative AI on the mucky stuff, then what you, we see is transformative. People are more excited about their work. They're more original. They're more creative because they're not searching through documentation that you don't really want to be doing anyway. So there's two aspects um, have been transformative to watch. You know, getting developers uh, mid-level or, you know, accelerated really quickly um, and then giving them their, their time back uh, to focus on the work that is most important to them and most interesting. I, I, I don't come from a coding background. And so I like, I love the idea of, of taking my thoughts and having code generated based on my thoughts. But I also really like the idea of then being able to look at that code and understand what I'm looking at. And so, right. so, you know, that's a very, that's a very real thing that is not going to go away. Yeah, I, I, I'm a database person um, as well. And uh, I would say when we started using managed databases, like in my world, it's RDS, everything that's a relational database service. Uh, I was not popular with DBAs because 70% of what a DBA does is super duper boring. And, and, and this, is, I, this is coming from a place of love as a former DBA, <laughs> but backups, patches, failovers are not that differentiated, not really. They're not unique to any given business. And having that taken over by managed service meant that we were shifting what a DBA actually does. I mean, these people went to school for information architecture and pushing the boundaries of insights and information, and they were doing backups. So what happened when we said, all right, well, 70% of you know where you're spending your time can be done by this tool. Then we saw the rise of data scientists and we saw the costs of data scientists go down because there were more people available in the market that could have a perspective on information architecture that were previously unavailable or doing something that wasn't necessarily driving a lot of value back into the organization that was very unique to that person and that organization. I see the same exact things happening right now, in particular with developers, is it gives them more opportunity to innovate and to do the things that are their most human uh, uh, in, in creating something new, something different, something, something that solves a problem in a unique way. These are all very human things. But writing a unit test, snoozeville. I mean, seriously, no, no, no developer on earth gets up in the morning and goes, oh, I'm gonna write 20 unit tests today, yes. Yeah, people. You know, no one is excited about it. People cling to it if they think it's the only way they can earn a living. And so, right. as long as they learn that that's not the case, um, we should we should all be okay. But what's 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 on the what's on the generative AI frontier uh, from an AWS perspective? What's coming? What secret stuff? No one else is listening. Just you and me, Rory. Mm -hmm, what's, mm -hmm. what's yeah, coming? I'm totally not going to get fired. Secret NDA. <laughs> 
let's take something you said earlier, like is code going away? Um, because it's something that's very personal to me because <clears throat> I have a 15 year old and I've been trying to teach this kid to code since he was four. I use code monkeys. You get the monkey to the banana and you learn Python over the course of 250 lessons. No, I can't make a scrapbook, but I know how to write code. So I was going with my strengths on this one. And I'm and part of me is like, I can't get those 10 years back. I mean, the syntax of writing Python, specific a specific language, when I look at my kid, by the time he hits the job market, is that going to be necessary? Because really, Python is an abstraction layer from the intent of what you want to create to ones and zeros. And what we have seen repeatedly with generative AI in production is it compresses the abstraction layers, compresses the space between intent to what you're trying to do. So the syntax of the abstraction layers becomes less significant. So in the fullness of time, do I think the goal of Python has fundamentally changed? Absolutely. Abstraction, the, the role of abstraction layers has fundamentally changed. I mean, just think about natural language. Like my kid's never gonna learn what a gerund is. He'll never understand a dangling parse participle. Because basically, he has a tool now that does all of that stuff for him, and it does it really reliably and really well, just creates the abstraction layer of communication. It's like, oh, here's a really nerdy metaphor. Do you ever take differential equations? Yes, I did. Oh, did you fail it? Because we all failed it once. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we didn't all fail it. Um, I remember the day that they allowed me to use a T65 on the right. test. Right. I, I mean, and that was four pages. <laughs> and but by the way, you have to learn how to use first. You have to learn how to use that tool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fair. But you also have to understand the fundamentals of differential equations, the humanistic aspect of applying a methodology or a mechanism and doing it well. Now, none of that went away. Differential equations still around. But the four pages of handwritten mistakes that I would make on the exam, gone. That's kind of what writing with generative AI is like. It it just eliminates the possibilities for mistakes with stuff that has repeatable patterns. So when I think about the future, uh, and I'm thinking pretty far out because I, I like to build for my kids. I want to create the world that I want my kids to live in. I love how their, their very mindset with technology has fundamentally changed compared to me. Like when I have a problem, I'm thinking, oh, I should build an app for that. Right. Like I'm trying to make a, an appointment with my dentist. Wouldn't it be great if I could just you know go to the portal and make the appointment? My kids don't think like that. They think, oh, I would just contact one of these super agents. They would stand up an MCP server that would communicate with the agent at the dentist and it would dynamically and ephemerally just get done. They do not think in applications, which opens the door for, well, rampant hyper personalization. If you are able to have an ephemeral or unique experience that is superior to a static experience, why wouldn't you do that? So I grew up with websites. You know, you build a website and a bunch of people will come to it. But and the experience isn't that different from one person to another. I mean, we've, we've pushed the boundaries of it with you know companies like Amazon that have very um, targeted experiences. Sure. They're personalized, but we're talking about hyper personalization where it already knows that I'm going on vacation. It already knows where I'm going on vacation. It already knows that it's a hot place and it has curated a capsule wardrobe in linen <laughs> so that I'm not too hot. And those are the suggestions from my concierge type experience. This this trend towards hyper personalization is going to affect not only your retail experience, but literally everything that we do moving forward, it's going to be far less static and standardized and consistent and far more idiosyncratic. I love it. So what did we learn here? We learned that if you're Rory's child, not only did you have to eat your vegetables, but you also had to write code. This is this is amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, 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 the, hopefully this will all turn out well with your optimistic view of the future. And I agree. I, I completely agree with you. I think that's I think that's where we're headed. Rory, thanks for joining us for this Enterprise AI Spotlight. Please stay connected with us on social and explore more conversations at 65media.com slash summit. On behalf of 65 Media, I'm Dave Nicholson. Stay tuned for more great coverage.